Now that we've talked about the titration schedule, let's talk about some of the side effects and special considerations with lamotrigine because the titration schedule is really based upon some of these. Overall, lamotrigine is generally quite well tolerated. It's considered to be a weight neutral agent, so most patients should not expect to gain significant weight on lamotrigine. The most common complaints that patients have are some cognitive side effects, often described as cognitive dulling, and some sedation. Nausea is also sometimes reported, though less common than with most antidepressants like SSRIs. Tremor, ataxia, and diplopia have also been reported, though generally at pretty low rates with lamotrigine. The side effect that people worry the most about with lamotrigine is Stevens-Johnson syndrome and related skin rashes. And in fact, there's a black box warning about life-threatening skin infections, including Stevens-Johnson syndrome, dress syndrome, and toxic epidermal necrolysis. Nearly all cases of these syndromes occur within the first two to eight weeks of starting the medication, so they tend to be early in the course and it is very rare for them to develop later in the course of lamotrigine. Many patients who start lamotrigine will develop a benign rash, and it's important for you as a prescriber to be able to help patients distinguish between a benign rash and a rash that's more concerning. Concerning rashes generally involve mucosal surfaces. They may include the palms or soles, and generally, they spread from the trunk to the extremities. Now, patients with any rash should be seen either by you as their prescriber or by a PCP, if possible, just so you can lay eyes on the rash and evaluate whether it may be concerning. If the rash sounds benign and looks benign, patients don't need to do anything in terms of holding or reducing the dose. If the rash sounds concerning, we would advise patients to hold the dose at least until they're examined. Interestingly, the likelihood of rash has been linked to certain HLA markers, and it's more common in some Asian populations. In the U.S., HLA typing is not routine prior to starting lamotrigine, but it is routine in some Asian countries because of the increased risk. Because of the risk of Stevens-Johnson or related rashes, if a patient misses three days or more of the medication, they should generally restart the titration from the beginning. This can be very annoying and concerning for patients, and it's important to consider, particularly if you're going to prescribe lamotrigine to somebody who may be at risk for poor medication adherence. Let's talk a little bit about lamotrigine in the setting of pregnancy and breastfeeding. So with regards to pregnancy, there have been concerns raised about an increased risk for cleft lip or palate in patients taking lamotrigine. It's important to keep in mind, though, that the studies are really mixed. If there is an increased risk, it's probably very minimal. And remember that cleft lip and cleft palate are the most common birth defects. So it's sometimes hard to really see whether there's an increased risk. There's no evidence that dose affects the risk. Pregnant women should not reflexively reduce the dose of lamotrigine when they find out they're pregnant, as the risk of destabilization significantly outweighs the risk of birth defects. Now, lamotrigine does enter breast milk in relatively high qualities, and the infant serum concentration will be about half of mom's serum concentration. There have been no adverse events reported from breastfeeding, but the general recommendation is not to breastfeed. Importantly, though, it's not an absolute contraindication and, again, should be a conversation between the prescriber and mom. Finally, while oral contraceptives do decrease lamotrigine levels, lamotrigine does not actually affect the levels of oral contraceptives. And this is a common myth. There's some concern that lamotrigine may make birth control ineffective. That is actually not true. The birth control has an effect on the lamotrigine level, but the converse is not true. From time to time, as with all psychiatric medications, patients may 
overdose on lamotrigine, and it's important to be aware of the likely sequelae of lamotrigine overdose. In overdose, lamotrigine can cause a variety of effects. One of the most common syndromes that's reported is an anticonvulsant hypersensitivity syndrome, and that will often present with fever, a skin rash, and sometimes can have internal organ involvement. Other symptoms that can be seen are neurological in nature and include delirium, tremors, myoclonus, hyperreflexia, and ataxia. And in that way, a lamotrigine overdose can actually look a lot like serotonin syndrome. Paradoxically, seizures have also been reported in the setting of lamotrigine overdose and are actually one of the most common outcomes with significant lamotrigine overdoses. And then, as we'll talk about a little bit later, lamotrigine in overdose can have some important cardiac effects to be aware of, and deaths have been reported from lamotrigine overdose. So to summarize some key points for this section, the most serious side effect associated with lamotrigine is a spectrum of skin rashes, including Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which can be life-threatening. If a patient reports a rash, it's very important to discuss the nature of the rash with them to determine if they need to be examined. Keep in mind, too, that Asian populations may be at increased risk for serious skin rashes. Lamotrigine is generally safe in pregnancy. There may be a very slightly increased risk for cleft lip and cleft palate, but the data is mixed. In overdose, lamotrigine can lead to a constellation of neurological symptoms that looks like serotonin syndrome and can also cause anticonvulsant hypersensitivity syndrome, seizures, cardiac arrhythmias, and death.